There is a story in 1 Kings chapter 17. We're going to begin in verse 8. It's in your Bibles, in your bulletins, and in your phones. 1 Kings 17, verse 8. The story reads like this. Then the word of the Lord came to him, to Elijah, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. Behold, look, I have commanded a widow there to feed you. So he arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the city, the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks, and he called to her and said, Bring me a little water in a vessel that I might drink. And as she was going to bring it, he called to her and said, oh, And bring a morsel of bread in your hand. And she said, As the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of flour in a jar and just a little bit of oil in a jug. And now I'm gathering a couple of sticks that I might go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we will eat it and die. And Elijah said to her, Do not fear, go and do as you said, but first make me a little cake of it and bring it to me, and afterwards make something for yourself and your son. And the story continues, but let's stop there. The sermon title for today, for this series, is um, spiritually... uh, I don't (laughs) know. There's no words for that. Sometimes there aren't words for the things that we're feeling. There's, there, it just, there's just certain emotions, certain experiences that are so um, disconnected from language that uh, I realized Elijah's story is, is unique. So this is how we are representing these messages now. So it's capital O underscore capital O. Because how can you... How can you experience something like that from, from the widow's point of view? She's out there. You imagine her that night before looking in, after having made a little bit of something just to put in her son's stomach. She probably gave a lot more to her son than she ate herself. And she knew going to bed that night that in the morning there would be barely anything left. A, a, a little bit of flour in a bin. A little bit of flour is, is how much is left over when you turn the bin over and you bang it a whole lot. That stuff that sticks to the outsides and that stuff falls down, the stuff that's in the edges of the bin, it all falls out. That's how much is left in that bin. And, and a drizzle of oil is when uh, you, know, you, you haven't gone to the store and, and you, you're, I need oil for this, and you just hold it and you stare at it, and you watch each drop come out. It's just a little bit of flour, a little bit of oil, and she knows that's all that's left in her, in her house, and she knows that this day is going to be the last day that she can do, be a mother to feed her son. This is the last time that she can provide for her child. And so she goes out that morning. She's out there, and she's gathering a couple of sticks so that way she can make a fire, so that we can knead the last of what they have, bake it for her son. And then this guy walks up, and he says, give me some water. Okay, I can find some water. And bring me something to eat. And you're like, listen, I don't have anything. I don't have anything for you, I don't have, certainly don't have anything for my son, so there's not going to be uh, any, I'm a, I'll get you your water. But then he says, no, give me the cake first, make something for me first, and then give something for the, you and your, and your son. And by the word of the Lord, there will be enough. What is going through your head? Enough? There wasn't enough yesterday. Why is there going to be enough now? She knows this man. She knows that he's a hunted man, Elijah. He's, he's being hunted by Ahab and all the surrounding countries. And she knows that this is a man of God. This is the, this is the man that, that said that there would not be rain for th- until he said, and it didn't rain. 
He spoke it, and it happened. And she knew that this man was also, he caused the rain not to fall, and therefore not enough food on her table. And, and it's not even her country's fault. She's from Zarephath. She's from Sidon. She's from the northern part above Jerusalem, above Israel. And so it's Israel's fault that God is angry with them. Why is she suffering? For their fault. And she's, she's, she, he has, says, bring something for me first. So now she has this, this dilemma. Does she give what she wants to give only to her son, to this man, this prophet of God, that has spoken a word to her of promise, of blessing, and of enough? And the story says, For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, the jar of flour shall not be spent, and the jug of oil will not be empty until the day that the Lord sends rain upon Elijah, uh, on, the, on the earth. And she said, she went and did as Elijah said. And she and her household ate for many days. The jar of flour was not spent, neither did the jug of, o- jug of oil become empty according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by Elijah. There's a few ways to look at this. If we look at it from Elijah's point of view, he's doing exactly what God said. He said, get up and go to Zarephath. I've commanded someone to be there for you to take care of you. So he gets up and he goes. This widow, she she obviously believes in God because she does what Elijah says. But this this test, this this thing that is asked of her, nothing could have been a a worse thing. She could have said, uh, God said, said uh, uh, go live in the wilderness, and she would have done it. That wouldn't have been as big of a, a test as this question, question to give uh, the last bit from her son to this man. And she, but she did it. She gave the bread, and you can imagine her anguish. What is she going to do? The, the concept, if we look at it from, from stand back and look at both people, Who is doing the giving? Who is doing the blessing? Obviously, God, he multiplied the, the, what was left, the oil and the bread, so that way there would be enough. He multiplied it so that they could eat. But Elijah was the one that it was done through. He, his action was very closely tied to what God did. That when, when, people of God obey the voice of God, when they reach out, then God acts through them. And even in Scripture, there isn't a... a, The division between the two is very blurred. At least they're connected. We look a little bit later in the story. It says this, verse 17. After this, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became ill... And his illness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. And she said to Elijah, What have you against me, O man of God? You have come to bring my sin to remembrance and to cause the death of my son. I can imagine this woman, as, he, as Elijah lived in her house, in this upper room, that she must have thought, if he hadn't come we would have died with that last meal. That must have been the first few nights. Like, oh, praise God. It's it's wonderful. Look at what God's doing. But then as she's closer to this this man of God, she must have also remembered all the things that she, all the things that she felt guilty for, all the things that were, that she felt she was doing against God and her past, her history. And it was all coming back. And then when her son dies, she's like, oh, this is it. God comes near to visit me, and he also brings his judgment on me. She's like, why did you even come here in the first place? It would have been better if if we had died before than for you to, to prolong all of this just to kill my son, and now I'm left alive. And he said to her, give me your son and he took him from his, her arms and carried him up to the upper chamber where he lodged, and he lay him on his own bed, and he cried out to the Lord, O oh Lord, my God, have you brought calam- calamity even upon this widow with whom I'm staying by killing her son? 
Even Elijah at this was broken. There was nothing, he had no idea what to do. And so he takes him and he prays, he calls out to God. And it says in verse 22, And the Lord listened to the voice of Elijah, and the life of the child came into him again, and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper chamber into the house and delivered him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son lives. And the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord is in your, in your mouth is truth. It's interesting that this woman saw this miracle that God obviously was doing every morning, there was just enough for the day. Enough for her, for her son, and for this, this other guy. There was enough. It's a miracle. It's amazing. But it wasn't until Elijah did something for her that she recognized that God was actually working through him. Today, we can do an awful lot of things for the people around us. We, we can preach an awful lot of things. We can say a lot of things. We can say, oh, you know, God, God will forgive you for your sin. God loves you. God cares about you too. But until we give an action that demonstrates it, people don't see it. No matter how miraculous the, act, the, the things that we've been saying before are. A little bit later in the Bible, in Luke chapter 7, In, the, in, in Nain, uh, verse 11, Luke 7, 11. Soon afterwards, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a great crowd went with him. As he drew near to the gate of the town, behold, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a considerable crowd from the town was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came up and touched the, the ca casket, and the bearer stood still, and he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother Fear seized them all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. And this report about him spread throughout the whole of Judea and all the surrounding country. This uh, later, another widow, her son dies, and he's being carried through the streets. And what might be going through her head? What do I have left? My son was all I had. He's gone. And I'm alone. Maybe she was weeping. Maybe she was in shock. As she's going, as she's going uh, along this by her son's side, she feels a tap on her shoulder, and she looks, and this man says, Don't be sad. What? Capital O, underscore capital O. What do, you, what do you mean, don't be sad? My son just died. And Jesus, he turns and he touches the casket. He says, I say to you, get up. And he gets up. I think of another story that's not in Scripture but is just as true a story of a single mom. She's, she's putting, she's trying to do her best to, she's working at a, a convenience store, at Kmart, or wherever, and she's trying to put food on her, the table for her kids. She's worried about where that next check is coming from. She's worried about will Section 8 come through this month. She's worried about 
where will, where will uh, all of the finances go? Are the kids being bullied at school? Uh, I can't be there after school. What can, what can, and she, all these things are going through her mind. And then God comes to her and he says, put me first. And she's like, are you kidding me? <laughs> like, I got my kids. Like, they come first. They're the first thing on my mind when I wake up, and they're the last thing on my mind when I go to sleep. I put them first. And then God says, yeah, give them time, but give me time first. What? Give me time first. I'm tired. I, I can't. I can't give you time first in, in the morning. I've got to get up and get things done. And at night, I'm, I need my sleep. Give you time first. Think of me first. Give me your finances first. Pay tithe? Give offering? No. Every bit goes to my kids. How can I be giving you anything first? How can I be thinking about other people's needs when I've got my kids to think about first? Give me your love first. Love. There's slim pickings out there, Lagwad. Slim pickings. This person's showing me interest. What am I going to do? Put me first. And so she does. You know, um, uh, I, I was reading through these passages, and I asked God, who, what, is, what, are these, what are these stories? What are these stories about? Like, you saw it happen. You knew these people. This is your, these are your daughters that were struggling. You know them? Tell, reveal to me their characters. Tell me about who they were. And I'm thinking about Scripture. I'm thinking about the story. I'm thinking about Elijah. I'm thinking about the bread. I'm thinking about the oil. And God said a name. I said, her? Like, that's, that, wh why, why are you making me think about her? I'm thinking about this widow from the, and then he said, this person. And then I kept thinking about their story, and I realized there's, there's so many people where this is their story. This is where the Elijah has come to them, and they've given their first to God, and, but then when their children get in, in trouble, so I have an apology. That's what I'm getting at. That... I've asked many of you, how, how are your children? How are you doing? I've never asked you, what can I do for your child? I've not said, what can I do for your kid? Maybe they are spiritually dead. Maybe they, they need some attention. Maybe they need someone to just pour some attention into them. And I've not offered that. So I apologize. But that's the work of God, and I need to do this. That I need to put God first. Since people are putting God first, I also need to put others first. When uh, there's a single mom, a homeless youth, somebody who doesn't have a parent with them, we become that parent. We become that man of God, that woman of God that comes into their life, that there's a reciprocity that goes on between those. We ask, when Elijah came to this widow and she says, my son, why did you do this to my son? Why did God do this to my son? When this, when this widow is walking next to this casket and she's asking God, why did you do this to my son? And then Jesus steps into the picture in both of these stories, all three of these stories. He says, oh, oh, bread. Oh, you need bread. Oh, you need oil. 
oh, I thought you needed something hard, you know, like, like getting society to change. <laughs> That's hard. No, I can give you bread. I can give you oil. And so he does that. Then the, then the woman by, the, by her son's casket, she says he's dead. Oh, death? Oh, I thought you needed something hard, like getting my people to, to get together to help you out. Oh, that, that's hard. That's difficult. Death? Psh, ain't, no, ain't no sting, you know? I go. And the single mom, the teenager on the street that's kicked out of their home, that has no more parents, like, got Jesus steps in there and says, Oh, what do you need? You need attention? You need care? That's all right. I got people down in that purple church. Who are we going to be in this story? The people that, that come into the home to bring somebody into ours, into our life, would be those people that are walking alongside the casket, weeping, weeping for this widow because they know that she is doomed to the society, that they know the, the consequences of, of what just happened to her. They know that nothing is going to change for her, and they know that they will not change for her. Or will they step up, or will we step up to the casket, and will we say, arise, I'm going to pour my attention in, and then let God do the rest, because he has said, may we be them, may we be Jesus. May God bless you all.